In the previous lesson, we discussed the close relationship between science and European imperialism. Without the contribution of scientific methods, knowledge, and ideology, it is hard to believe that the Europeans could have conquered the world. On the other hand, without imperial support, it is doubtful whether modern science would have progressed very far. In this lesson, we'll examine the rise of the capitalist economy and explain how it was closely connected with both modern science and the European empires. Economics is often seen as a notoriously complicated subject, but understanding modern, scientific, modern economic history and the rise of the capitalist system is actually quite easy. All you really need to know in order to understand uh, modern economic history is to understand a single word. This word is growth. The most unique and important characteristic of the modern capitalist economy is that it is growing all the time. Every year we produce more than last year and we have more goods and more money and more, more everything. In 1500, Global production of goods and services in the entire world together is estimated to have been equal to about $250 billion in today's dollars. Today, global production hovers around the mark of $60 trillion. More importantly, in 1500, annual per capita production the production of a single person on average was $550 a year. Today, on average, every man, woman, and child on earth produces $8,800. To understand how the modern economy grows at such an astounding rate, let's begin with a simple example. Suppose you want to open a new business. Say you want to open a new bakery. And you don't have the money. What do you do? What you do is you go to the bank and uh, ask the bank for a loan. Now, how come the bank has money uh, to give you? Because people put their earnings into the bank. Let's say that in your city there is a big contractor who has just finished a, a big project, say building an Italian restaurant, and he earned $1 million, so he takes this $1 million and puts them in the bank, in his, in his account, and the bank now has $1 million, right? So, as you go to the bank, and you tell the banker about your dream of opening a bakery, the bank has money to give you. You present your business plan to the banker, explain all, all the, the bakeries that you want to do and how much money it will make, explain to the banker that you don't have money at present, so you need a loan from the bank. And if the banker is convinced by what you tell her, then she can take the $1 million she has and loan them to you, so you can build your bakery. You now have a $1 million, you're very happy, and you go and you hire the same big contractor to build your bakery. When you pay the contractor, say the contractor demands a million dollars, when you pay this million dollars to the contractor, he now goes and deposits this money also in his bank account. Now a simple question. How much money does the contractor have now in his bank account? The answer is simple, $2 million. The $1 million from before, from the Italian restaurant, and the $1 million from you, that you now paid him to build your, your bakery. So the, the, uh, the account of the contractor has $2 million in it. But how much money, cash, is there actually in the bank? There is only $1 million. Because the previous million dollars, the bank loaned it to you, and this is the million dollars that you gave the, the contractor. Now it becomes more uh, strange. Let's assume that two months after beginning to build your bakery, the contractor comes to you and tells you that there are all kinds of unforeseen problems and expenses, and the cost of building your bakery 
is not one million dollars, it's two million dollars. You're obviously not happy with that, but what can you do? You go back to the bank, you explain what happens, and if you're lucky, you get another million dollars from the bank, and you transfer this money to the contractor. Now, another simple question. How much money does the contractor have in his bank account now? He's got three million dollars now. But how much money is there actually in the bank? There is still just one million dollars. In fact, it's the same million dollars that's been there all along. According to, U to current US banking law, the bank can repeat this exercise seven more times. It can seven more times loan you one million dollars so that eventually the contractor would have 10 million dollars in his account when in fact the bank has only one million dollar in its safe. Banks are allowed, according to today banking uh, uh, laws, banks are allowed to loan $10 for every dollar that they actually possess. If you go to the bank and put the $1, the bank is allowed to loan other people $10. Where did the other $9 come from? This is what we'll try to understand uh, in, in this lesson. But this means, this is very important to understand, more than 90% of the money in all the bank accounts today in the world is not covered by anything. There is nothing there. If all the bank, if, if all the account holders at your bank, say Berkeley's bank, if all the account holders at Berkeley's bank will come to the bank and say, give us my money, give us our money, I want the money that's in my account, the bank will immediately collapse because the bank doesn't have all the, all the money. And the same is true not only of Barclays, but also of Deutsche Bank and Citibank and Lloyd and all the other banks in the world. None of them have in their possession the money that appears in the bank accounts. This may sound to you like a giant fraud, but if this is fraud, then the entire modern capitalist economy is a fraud. Now, some people say it is, but the fact is, that uh, it's not a fraud, it's been working in an amazing way for hundreds of years. It's rather not, uh, it's not a deception, but it's a tribute to the amazing abilities of the human imagination. What enables banks and the entire capitalist economy to survive and to flourish is our trust in the future. What covers almost all the money in the world is our trust in the future. For example, in the, in the case of, of the bakery, the gap between the account statement of the contractor, which says $3 million, and the, bank, and the money actually in the bank, which is just $1 million, what covers the, uh, uh, the, the gap is your bakery, your future bakery. The bank loaned you the missing money, trusting that one day your bakery will be built and will be profitable. The bakery hasn't baked yet a single loaf of bread or a single cake, but you and the banker who gave you the loan, you think that a year from now the bakery will be selling thousands of bread loaves and cakes and cookies every day and will make a lot of money. Then, in the future, in this imaginary future, you will be able to repay the loan that you took from the bank along with the interest and the bank will then be able to give the contractor all the money in his account if, if the contractor will demand it. The entire enterprise, the entire economy is thus based on our trust in an imaginary future. Uh, the trust that you and everybody else have and the trust that the banker have in the bakery that may, be exist, may, may exist in one year, along with the trust that the contractor has in his bank. This is why he puts the money in, his, in the bank, because he trusted that in the future the bank will give him back his money plus interests. This is how the capitalist economy functions, by trusting the future. 
And this is why it grows so rapidly. The secret, the magic of capitalism is that it finances present expenses with make-believe money that has no cover in the present and may only may have cover in the future. This is why it is able to grow so fast. For most of, of history, the economy was frozen. It hardly grew at all because it was very, very hard to finance new enterprises because people did not trust in the future. Let's say that, again, you want to open a new bakery, but you live not in the 21st century, you live in the Middle Ages, before the rise of the capitalist system. In order to build your bakery, you need to pay a builder, and you need uh, uh, to buy an oven and pots and pans and knives and spoons and everything else needed for a bakery. But you don't have money. Once the bakery will be open, then you can earn a lot of money by selling bread and cakes and everything. But how can you start earning that money if the bakery doesn't exist? And how can you build the bakery in the first place if you don't have money? This is the trap that froze the human economy for centuries and for millennia. Without a bakery, you can't bake cakes. Without cakes, you can't make money. Without money, you can't pay the builder. And without a builder, there is no bakery. So what can you do? Humankind was trapped in this vicious circle for thousands of years. And this meant that economic growth was very slow and very limited. It was very hard to start new businesses or to expand existing businesses. The way out of the trap was discovered only in the modern era with the appearance of a new system, the capitalist system, which is based on credit. In a capitalist system, people agree to represent imaginary goods goods that don't exist at all in the present, with a special kind of money, which we call credit. In a capitalist system, if you want to open a new bakery and you don't have any money, you go to the bank and you ask the bank to give you credit. If you convince the bank that your plan is sound, the bank will give you this credit, will loan you some money, and now you can take the credit you, you received from the bank and pay the contractor and buy all the oven and pots and pans and everything you need to start the bakery. And when you eventually start making money from this bakery, then you can repay the loan to the bank plus some interest. This is the way in which credit enables us today to build the present at the expense of the future and this is what enables the economy to grow so fast. The crucial thing to realize about credit is that credit is based on the trust in the future. And we, we had a lesson about money, and we said that money in general is based on trust. But money before the modern age was based on the trust in things that exist in the present. For example, you, uh, uh, you trust in the power of the king at present, and therefore you trust his coins. Credit, on the other hand, is much more sophisticated than just any kind of money. Credit is money which is based on trust in the future, in things that don't exist at all anywhere in the present, but may exist someday in the future. The bank, and again, in the, in the example of the bakery, the bank agreed to give you credit because it trusted this fantasy of a bakery, which may exist a year from now, two years from now. If credit is such a wonderful thing, how come nobody thought of it earlier? Well, of course they did. People have been loaning money to one another for thousands of years. We have written evidence of loans from ancient Shumer 5,000 years ago. The problem in previous era was not that nobody could imagine what credit is. The problem was that people did not want to extend much credit because they didn't trust 
that the future would be better than the present. As we saw in the lesson about the scientific revolution earlier, people in traditional societies did not believe in progress. They tended to assume that things were better in the past and the future will be worse than today, or at best, that the future will be just like the present. To put this in, econo to put this in economic terms, people believed that the total amount of wealth in the world is limited, is stable, if not dwindling, less and less wealth. People therefore considered it <coughs> a bad bet to assume that they personally, or their kingdom, or the entire world, would be producing more wealth 10 years from now. Of course, the profits of a particular bakery might rise, but only at the expense of another bakery. One city might flourish, but only if another city became poor, impoverished. The king of England might enrich himself, but only by robbing the king of France. The idea was that the economic pie of the world is of a given size. You could cut this economic pie in many different ways, but it never got any bigger. That's why many cultures concluded that making a lot of money and being rich was sinful, was bad. Jesus in the New Testament said that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And many people still today don't really understand how capitalism works, and they still think that the economic pie is static. And if I have a bigger part of the pie, it must be because I took a slice from somebody else. And indeed, if the economic pie stays the same size, then you cannot really enrich yourself except by robbing other people. And it also means that there is little reason to extend much credit to people. Credit is actually the difference between the size of the economic pie today and the size of the economic pie tomorrow. If the pie stays the same, why extend credit? Why assume that, he will be, that whoever you loan the money to would be able to repay you if the economy doesn't grow? This is why in the pre-modern, pre-capitalist world, it was very hard to get loans. And if you did manage to get a loan, loans were usually small, they were short-term, and they were subject to high interest rates. You got only small sums, you had to repay them quite quickly in a few months, and you had to pay exorbitant uh, rates of interest. This made it very difficult to start new enterprises, like new bakeries. Because credit was limited, people had trouble financing <coughs> new businesses. Because there were very few new businesses, the economy indeed did not grow. Because the economy did not grow, the trust in the future remained small, and people didn't want to extend much credit. And this is how the expectation of stagnation fulfilled itself, because people did not believe that the economy will grow. Indeed, the economy didn't grow. How did humankind eventually broke this vicious circle? This is the question which we'll try to answer in the next segment.